the thermodynamic cycles that we uh, typically encounter in internal combustion engines, they're all made up of individual processes. And that's what we usually, uh, that's what uh, so far we've studied. So for example, in a PV plane, if we looked at the auto cycle, well, this is comprised, our ideal auto cycle is comprised of one isentropic compression like this, S equal to a constant. Well, that's an individual path, right? It, it sort of doesn't matter what it's part of, if it's an auto cycle or a diesel cycle or a dual cycle, it's always the same if I know the initial state and I know the degree of compression, so I know the compression ratio from uh, whatever it is, the bottom dead center to the top dead center volume. If I know the compression ratio, then I can define this path. Now I define the specific type of cycle by grafting on um, different uh, or the different subsequent processes. So if I want to make an auto cycle, then I would create or I would tack on a constant volume heat addition. Whereas if I want to make a diesel cycle, then I want to tack on a constant pressure heat addition this and the general dual cycle is one where we have a here i'm going to switch color uh, i'm going to put some sort of purple so where we would have a partially constant volume and then constant pressure heat addition so that would be what constitutes the dual cycle and then we expand back out so each of these cycles but then expand back out so for the whoops can we go back to black so for the constant uh, for the diesel cycle we'd have a constant entropy expansion, uh, same thing for the auto cycle, this, and then our dual cycle, put it in sort of purple, and I sort of randomly drew those lines here. Um, yeah, I sort of randomly drew those lines there, they're a little bit far apart, but it doesn't, that's not the, the point of the, the story, is that the point of the, the point of this uh, discussion here is that the individual, uh, or the individual types of cycles are just defined by the succession of individual processes that I'm tacking on. And what we've done so far is learn how to deal with individual cycles or individual processes, I'm sorry. Um, in these three, so in the, in the auto cycle, in, in the dual cycle, in the diesel cycle, one basic characteristic is that the, the geometry, well, the, the geometry of the engine on compression is equal to that on expansion. So that means that we go from here, I'm going to put states one to two, or as we go this way, we go from bottom dead center to top dead center. We have um, one compression here. We're going to call it the, the compression compression ratio. And then as we come back out, so after, so for the diesel cycle, there is no constant volume portion, but for the dual cycle and the auto cycle there is, but when we move back out, there is an expansion ratio, which in this case is equal to the compression, compression or the compression ratio. And these two are equal. Um, how would we how would we make these different? Uh, well, A is why would we make these different, and then how? This is what creates uh, what we call the Atkinson or the Miller cycle. I personally. Um, like to think of the Atkinson and Miller as like a class of cycle because there's nothing that prevents you from doing a, a sort of Miller-like cycle for a diesel engine um, or for constant pressure heat addition. Although typically we think of these as uh, spark ignition, constant volume combustion. So for the Atkinson cycle here we have, or the Miller cycle, I'm gonna use these terms interchangeably. We create we create this type of cycle by the easiest way is to uh, change, is to radically change the closing time of the intake valve. So imagine we go, we have, uh, this is our exhaust. So we push out material, then we suck in, and then we sort of have a choice. So let's say I would go all the way out. So I would I have the piston goes out, we push out, this is the exhaust stroke, then we, suck in a fresh charge of material, and then I push some of it back out through the intake. And this is normally done, you know, the, 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 the closing of the intake valve 
is in actual engines is not exactly at um it's never exactly at bottom dead center but it's never so extreme that it's like a third of the way in or half of the way in which is what we would do in in these cycles we would actually close the intake valve as the as we've have left in the cylinder only a partial charge then we close and then we have the compression like this so now we have an effective compression ratio rc which is less than let's call it rc and then this compression ratio this is the geometric compression ratio like that's that's the that's the the the, the mechanically defined compression ratio between like the furthest a position of the piston from the head and the closest position of the piston from the head. These are defined by the ratios of the connecting rod and the, the crank arm and so on. Um, but the the there's an effective compression ratio which is less than that because we've kept the pressure in the piston or in the cylinder constant as we as we are filling and then we come back in and then we close it when the piston is significantly in from um or from the bottom dead center position um in this particular there's a minor change so in this particular case we we went through the exhaust phase then a full intake and then we come back and then we spill back some intake fluid and then we close but we could have we could have done uh, something slightly modified where we push out all of the exhaust close the exhaust valve open the intake valve and then suck in only a partial charge and then close way early and then what happens is that the piston is going to have to move down because it's geometrically forced to do it. And then in that case, because all the valves are closed, now we're, we're, this partial charge is expanded. And so the pressure goes down and then it's going to come back up to our initial point. So we have this little sort of expansion compression phase, which carries no, carries no work, ideally no work with it because this, this portion here is both a, a positive integral and a negative integral. So they cancel out. We get zero, we get zero network out of this. So in both cases, we end up compressing. So this is my point 0.1, point 0.2. Then we add heat, Q in, raise the pressure. And then we expand from top dead center all the way out to all the way out through the entire geometric expansion ratio. So RE is on greater than RC. And it looks bizarre like this, but if you if you if we go back, if we go back to our um, if we go back to our, our sort of standard cycles, the auto dual and diesel, basically what we're doing is we're saying that at point four here one two three four so at point four there's still there's still potential energy left in the gas the pressure is high it could push on the piston further and so we're actually just going to allow the piston to expand further out let's say up to this point and then there's a little and we lose less pressure and then we come back like this so what we've done is we have essentially recovered for the same heat input we have recovered this amount of work which is what we see here on the right plot on the on the dedicated Atkinson and Miller plot here if we did not if we had the expansion ratio equal to the effective compression ratio then I would have lost this hatched portion of work there that we've recovered in the Miller cycle so that should naturally lead so for the same QN for the same heat input This gives us more work out, more net work. So this must lead to a more effective, uh, uh, thermally ef uh, efficient cycle. So the thermal efficiency has to go up. Okay, so we're talking about all of this and now we'd like to formally, has to be a for more formal way to compare these. And let's do this. So I'm just gonna close the whiteboard and I'm gonna share the screen. So we'll go to our slides. And these are the slides eight in the course. 
And here I've, I've opened them up on the dual cycle. This is what I was saying before is that essentially what you've been learning in your, uh, in your previous courses and, and material and the previous videos in this course is how to handle individual processes, right? One to two, what is that process? Two to 2.5, what is that process? 2.5 to three and so on. And then what we did in the, uh, the topic B1 video is we took all of these processes together. So one to two to two and a half to three to four. And then we went through and considered the entire cycle to formulate a single, for our ideal cycle, a single um, uh, thermal efficiency formula. So for the dual cycle, for example, when we consider all four, four or five processes, how you, however you want to count, we found that the dual cycle has this uh, particular thermal efficiency, which is a function of R, the geometric uh, compression or expansion ratio, and gamma, which is K, same again in the context of this course, we can think of these as equal. It has beta, which is the cutoff ratio, the same definition as, um, as for the, um, the diesel cycle. Okay, I'm just going to write these here. So beta, well, actually we have it here. So beta, this is the same definition as the cutoff ratio. And we have alpha, which is the, which is a new, a new ratio. This is the, it's basically how much does the, oops, how much does the pressure increase through the constant volume part of the cycle? So we have a constant volume and constant pressure heat addition. And then we have the rest of the expansion like this. So alpha is sort of this increase and then beta is that increase. So if beta goes to one, so that these two volume, basically volume at three goes to two and a half, which is, um, that becomes three. Then we have the auto cycle. And if alpha goes to zero, that is if the pressure goes down to the pressure idea of the, of the combustion. So alpha, uh, sorry, if alpha is equal to, or goes to one, then we have essentially the diesel cycle. And this should actually recover, right? So if, if alpha goes to one, let's see one minus one, this term here disappears. And then we have a alpha, this is one, one, and that's essentially the formula for the diesel cycle. Um, and then we said if beta goes to one, so if beta goes to one, then we have on the top, this becomes alpha minus one, because one to whatever, uh, whatever power is just one. We have an alpha minus one, and if beta goes to one, then this term here is zero, so this whole thing here goes away. And then we have alpha minus one over alpha minus one, and that's the uh, that's just one. So then we have the auto cycle. That's right. In the in the case of uh, beta goes to one, so this is the beta goes to one limit. This is the alpha goes to one limit. So you can think of the dual cycle as sort of a catch-all cycle that would uh, that would um, um, encompass all of the um, that could encompass all the 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 different types of cycle that we normally see. Okay, so now we want to compare these together. And so we've drawn in the, uh, in the B1 video, we looked at the uh, this is the curve of change in compression ratio. What is the indicated or the thermal efficiency of the engine? So we have the curve here, which is the auto cycle, Zoop, like this. Um, and then we have the, on the bottom is the diesel cycle. And then in this particular case, so P3 over P1 equals 50. So if we pick a certain ratio of uh, so if we pick a certain ratio of, uh, of pressures, then we can vary from as we change that or, or yes, just want to make sure I'm getting it right here. So as we, uh, as we change the, the value of alpha, then we sort of smoothly go from the auto cycle to the dual cycle. Sorry, from the auto cycle to the diesel cycle. 
Um, so that tells me that at a given, so actually this is interesting. So at a given compression ratio here, let's pick this one, 12.5. So at a given compression ratio, we find that the diesel cycle is less efficient than the dual cycle, which is less efficient than the auto cycle. So for a given compression ratio, I, I want the same. So for a given compression ratio and the same heat input, I would want the auto cycle. I would want to favor the auto cycle. Um, so then why do we build diesel engines ever? Um, here on the, so here on the bottom, we have the, this is the mean, mean effective pressure, which of course, yes, at a given, uh, at a given compression ratio, obviously the diesel cycle has a lower mean effective pressure for the same QN because uh, the efficiency is lower. Okay. So why would we ever want to build diesel cycle? And that's because comparing um, comparing these um, uh, so comparing uh, um, comparing these cycles based on the same compression ratio is maybe not the best comparison. Um, this is because here I'm just going to find some room here. I'm going to annotate here. So. When we compare these cycles, so if I draw for the same compression ratio in the same inlet conditions, P1, V1, uh, that means I have the same first compression phase, and then we have constant volume heat addition for auto. Here's the dual cycle, and then here's the diesel cycle, and then we expand back out to a point which is essentially very close to each other out here, our point four, and then we come back down. So the diesel cycle has less work than the dual cycle. I'm going to hatch it backwards. And the auto cycle has even that much more here. So we see that there is more. This would be in PV plane. So we have more work output for the auto cycle. But there's a limit. There's a, uh, uh, this comes at the expense of raising the pressure significantly. Um, so you're sort of not utilizing, you're not utilizing the full potential of the diesel cycle, because if your if your engine is able to withstand such a high pressure, then like if your your physical engine block can withstand this high pressure, then why don't you just compress more for the diesel cycle? And that's another comparison, which is at the same maximum pressure, which is a material limit, right? This is the maximum. Uh, pressure that the material can handle. Then we see the auto cycle has to stop here. So if we start from the same volume, the auto cycle has to stop at a lower compression in order to not be uh, completely uh, sort of submerged or, or in order to not exceed this maximum pressure. The diesel cycle, on the other hand, can keep compressing all the way out to here because it's gonna it's going to compress at constant pressure. So I'm sort of utilizing, I'm utilizing the entire pressure range that my device can withstand. So the diesel cycle has this much extra area. And then this dual cycle stands somewhere in between, right? We'll stop the compression earlier. Then we have a, here, I'm gonna switch color. Um, then we have a, a constant pressure uh, a constant pressure uh, heat addition, and then, or sorry, constant volume heat addition, followed by constant pressure heat addition. So we're recovering part of this extra work that we can get, but not the full thing, not like diesel. So at constant, at a constant compression ratio, then the efficiency of auto beats the dual cycle beats the diesel cycle. This is what we see uh, on these plots here. And at constant P max, the efficiency of the diesel cycle beats the dual cycle, which beats the auto cycle. And this is what, here I'm going to erase it, but essentially this is what is on this slide here. So, whoops. So for the same inlet conditions, P1, V1, and the same compression ratio, the auto cycle wins. For the same inlet condition and the same peak pressure, the same maximum pressure, 
then uh, the diesel cycle wins. Aha. Okay. We can look at this in a slightly different. Uh, well, we've I've I've been drawing these in in the PV plane, which we see on the upper left uh, upper left corner. So we have the this is for the same compression ratio. Actually, on the upper on the upper rows, both PV planes. So for the same compression ratio, we see the diesel cycle goes from two to three C, and now we have only a little bit of area. We can look at this in the TS plane as well. So one to two is constant entropy compression. And then we add energy at constant pressure, which is this shallower line here from two to three C. Uh, the dual cycle adds first at constant pressure, uh, constant volume, and then at constant pressure. And the auto cycle adds constantly at constant pressure at, at constant volume. And so the lines in the TS planes, the lines are uh, steeper and steeper because when I add at constant pressure, so if I look at the extreme, when I add at constant, when I add heat at constant pressure, some of that heat goes into raising the internal energy of the material, it raises temperature, but then some of the energy has to go to do work because it's at constant pressure, the volume changes. So I have to, I'm, I'm constantly extracting work. Whereas at constant volume, the energy goes straight into raising the internal energy of the gas or so raising the temperature. And there is no work output. So I haven't lost any of that energy. It all goes to constant pressure. So the temperature has to rise faster at constant volume. So that's why the constant volume path, so the constant volume path is steeper than the constant pressure path. And then we see the dual cycle is sort of just in between there. Um, so on the TS plane, the um, on the TS plane, the what am I trying to say? On the TS plane, the area is the net amount of heat in, and the efficiency is basically given. So we have here in the center box is one minus. So the top here is the um, the basic definition of of thermal efficiency for for a cycle. Uh, so one minus Q out over Q in, and for a um, for an ideal cycle, Q, or for a reversible cycle, uh, Q in or out is the integral of TDS. So it's very analogous to my PV plane. It's the area under that curve. So from four to one, that is the that is the um, that is Q out, and the area under two to whichever of three A, three B, three C, that's my Q in. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna clear all the drawings. So on the left, what we have is if I keep the compression ratio constant, that means I go from one to two on the same line. On the right here, we're keeping the maximum pressure the same, but um, uh, we keep the maximum pressure the same, except that uh, we vary the compression ratio so that the maximum pressure and the maximum uh, temperature are all reached at 0.3. Again, this is for an ideal gas. So that 0.3 is going to, uh, the maximum pressure condition uh, with all of the heat added gives me the maximum temperature condition. And so we see that from, so the auto cycle in order to reach that point has to be, um, my apologies, I'm just going to, okay. So the, um, Uh, the compression ratio that's required for Otto, because the heat addition curve is steeper to reach the same point three, I have to cut the compression ratio before. For the dual cycle, I can compress a little bit more. And for the diesel cycle, I can compress uh, the most. And the efficiency is directly linked to the size of that, uh, of that area in the TS plane, same as the size of the PV, which is in, in based on work. So for the same amount of, here on the bottom, I'm going to cross hatch. So for the same amount of uh, heat release, the cycle that has the highest efficiency is whichever cycle has the largest amount of, the largest amount of energy or the largest amount of Q on the top here or the largest amount of TDS on the top. And that happens to be the diesel cycle. Okay.
So this is how we'd compare. Oops, here, let me just erase. Um, just clear all the drawings. Oops. Um, so comparing these ideas, it would suggest that the most efficient engine would have combustion as close as possible to constant volume, but would be compression ignition and operate at the higher compression ratio. Okay, something to think about. Um, so those are our three classic cycles that we look at. So auto, dual, and diesel. Uh, we have a new one, well, a new one, which isn't that new, and the Atkinson cycle, the idea of the Atkinson cycle has been around a long time, um, but it's gaining back in popularity um, because, of, because it, can, it can potentially attain much higher efficiencies, and we'll see, we'll see why. So here's the, the plot that we drew at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this video where we see our point one here is part, is in between the bottom dead center and the top dead center, that we have ingested only a partial charge so that the effective, the compression ratio, if, or the effective compression ratio is, I don't wanna say effective compression ratio because we usually reserve that word for two stroke cycles, but the compression ratio is tighter or is shorter than the expansion ratio. So we're gonna define a new quantity um, lambda, which will be the ratio of the expansion over the compression ratio. So this expansion ratio over, not the geometric, but over the used compression ratio, like this. And obviously if, if lambda is equal to one, then what I have is the underlying cycle. It's basically either the auto cycle um, or the dual cycle or the, uh, the diesel cycle, you could, you could technically implement, there's nothing stopping you from implementing this with a diesel engine or, um, or a dual cycle engine. Okay. So if we consider the same, so the basic processes are the same as before, isentropic compression, uh, in this case, constant volume heat addition, isentropic expansion, um, and then we have to be careful, there's a little bit, so usually we, uh, we don't consider work in the exhaust phase, although in this case, there is a little bit of, uh, of work to be considered here, because right? there's a little constant pressure region that we can't, uh, we can't uh, neglect. So we have to take it into account when we calculate the net work, um, but otherwise, um, another way, yeah, another way to think about it is that part of the part of the compression phase is work at constant entropy, and part of that ideal compression phase is work at constant pressure. So we have to add that in. So when we consider these, when we consider these these um, uh, these uh, five pieces of the cycles. There's probably, there's one here that I should fix these slides here to add. There's a fifth process here. This is four to five is constant volume here rejection. And then there's a process five to one, which is constant P heat rejection. This, okay. Um, so when we consider these five processes together, and then again, defining lambda as the ratio of the expansion ratio to the compression ratio, then we can write this crazy looking, this crazy looking uh, thermal efficiency, uh, indicated thermal efficiency formula, which depends on lambda RC, which is really so lambda RC, that's the expansion ratio. So what's Inside of here, I could just write this as Re, and then one minus, this is a one minus gamma, one minus K. So this becomes one minus one over Re to the K minus one. That looks like Otto, but then I have to subtract this big thing here. This is, let's see, Lambda to the one minus K minus blah, blah, blah. I have to put all that in. And then there's, this is actually a function of uh, Q in over P1, V1. So it's a function of the heat release. So times one over 
uh, the scaled heat release, however you want to call it, Qn over P1 V1. Okay, so on the right here, I have the, this is the efficiency ratio. So this is the, let's see, this is not the thermal efficiency. See, it doesn't start at, at zero, it starts at one. So that's the efficiency of the Miller cycle over the efficiency of the underlying um, of the base or, hold on, the efficiency when lambda is equal to one. So if this is a constant volume heat addition, then the efficiency when lambda is equal to one is just the auto cycle efficiency. Um, so it turns out that this whole, let me just let me erase a little bit of scribbling. So when I look at the thermal efficiency, the heat release is always a positive number. So it just turns out that this full thing here turns out to be less than zero all the time. Yes. So I'm getting efficiency back. Okay. So here's what happens. So here's my efficiency ratio. So if I have a compression ratio of, we pick um, just for demonstration, actually this is adapted from uh, the book by uh, Ferguson and Kirkpatrick. So compression ratio of eight. So we're going to pick an engine just to see how this uh, function behaves because there's a lot of parameters there. So I'm going to fix the compression ratio at eight. I'm going to fix gamma or, or K at 1.3. And then I'm going to fix the amount of heat input. Okay. So when lambda is equal to one, the efficiency is one. The efficiency is just the auto cycle efficiency. And then if I expand, let's say twice as much as I compress. So that is if I close the, if I close the intake valve when the piston is coming back and it's halfway up, then I get a boost of about 20% more efficiency. Ooh. Not nothing. Um, let us see. So what happens when we change? Oh, that is interesting. So if I change the compression ratio, actually, if I increase the compression ratio, the base efficiency goes up, but like the, the, the underlying auto cycle efficiency goes up, but uh, the effect of lambda decreases. So for, for the compression ratio of 10, then let's see, we're only gaining 15, something like 17% efficiency. For a compression ratio of 12, we're looking at 15%. But again, the underlying efficiency goes up, right? Because the, uh, for, for an auto cycle, the, the efficiency of the auto cycle goes up as I increase the compression ratio. So this is not necessarily a net a net loss. Um, now this comes at a big price in IMAP, in the mean effective pressure. So what happens is that this is the, let's see, so this is the Miller, uh, the Miller cycle mean effective pressure over the Otto cycle mean effective pressure. So again, if lambda is equal to one, then the mean effective pressure is just that of the Otto cycle. And now if I expand, twice as much as I compress, then I find, ooh, that it's roughly, I'm drawing a bit crooked, actually, here I can make straight lines. That's ah, so roughly good. Uh, I'm at about 55% of the mean effective pressure. So we've lost about 45% of our work output. It's much more efficient. I haven't had to put in as much Q to get at 55%. But I get a lower amount of, uh, I get a lower um, net work output. Huh. And this is roughly, I mean, it, it is dependent on compression ratio, but as you can see here, here we have, whoops, all three um, compression ratios that we considered, 8, 10, 12. And these functions are, are like within a, a, an electron of each other. So these are, these are, very, very close to each other. So that, that dependence is not, it's not very dependent on the compression ratio. It's really the function lambda that influences this behavior. Um, okay, so that means I can make a much more, so I can make a much more efficient engine, but that comes at the expense of a reduced amount of work. 
well, there's one thing I could do with this is I could put like a, a turbocharger in front to raise the amount or a supercharger to raise the to raise the amount of gas that I put in. So if I if I put in a small turbo to raise the amount of mass inside the cylinder, then I can increase uh, the amount of work output, but keep the efficiency of um, the efficiency of the Miller cycle. Yay. Um, there is, I mean, there is an interplay between these two things in that they're actually sort of trying to achieve the same goal. Um, let me, I'm just going to try to find some room here. I'm going to clear these drawings. Okay. Here, let me just stop this. So just to finish this, uh, this exploration, I'm going to go back to our whiteboard. So I just said you could pair an Atkinson cycle with a small turbo to increase the amount of mass that's inside. And actually these two things are sort of trying to do the same thing. I'm gonna draw the PV plane. So let's draw a base, oops, photocycle. So I have compression, heat addition, expansion, like that. So now this is my, this is the basic uh, one, two, three, four. This is the basic auto cycle. What a turbo does is it actually takes, well, this is, it's recognizing that uh, I'm losing potential energy here. When I open the exhaust valve, I hear this, psh, that's, the, that's the gas that's basically pushing against the atmosphere and it's expanding like this, right? It follows this process here from four to whatever, like five prime, it's, it's, it's not, I'm drawing it in a dashed line because it's no longer a closed system. And I've opened the valve, now it's an open system, but every little chunk of gas that's in there is following that dashed line. It's an isent ideally isentropic expansion, just out. And it goes down like this, a four to five prime. And that's work, right? If I, this is, this is work that I could use. So what a turbo does, a turbocharger does, is that it takes that gas and instead of letting it expand against the atmosphere, it ships it through a turbine and then it uses that expansion to drive a turbine that will in turn drive the, um, that will in turn uh, drive a, a little compressor at the intake that will raise the initial density of the gas. So I could take that work, put it in through a turbine, Zoop, and then out, this is a turbocharger. And then this is sent to a compressor. The work is sent to a compressor that will raise the, the amount of gas inside, um, inside the intake or raise the initial pressure. Another way to do this is to, well, you don't have a turbine, but you've got a piston. And this is essentially what the Miller cycle is doing. So in the Miller cycle, we're actually, so we have the same one to two, heat addition out to four. And then instead of letting that gas expand again against anything, then I'm basically saying, well, just expand out against the piston. Expand against piston to gain efficiency. And this is work that goes into the output of the engine, sort of like, um, so for a turbocharger, I take this work and I ship it back to the inlet gas for a Miller cycle, I take that work and I ship it out to uh, the actual drivetrain so that I can, I can use it or I ship it out to the engine, to the crankshaft so that I can use it to do something else with it, either power the car or, or whatever. And then we go out and come back like this. Yeah. So it's actually, it's actually trying to achieve the same goal is to use that amount of um, that amount of wasted work that normally goes out either by expanding against the piston or expanding against a tur or through a turbine. And that's a comparison of the, the, um, the big classes of, uh, the large classes of cycles that we see for internal combustion 